Today, we delve into science fiction and fantasy with novelist Chad R. Odom. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. I am the author of the Book of Random Tables as well as other RPG resources. You can find those at DiceGeeks.com. You can also find them at Amazon and DriveThruRPG. Just go ahead and search for Dice Geeks or Random Tables and I should come up. I am excited about today's show. My guest and I were able to have some very fascinating conversations about Dungeons & Dragons and writing novels, as well as kind of a disaster experience that uh, my guest uh, had with his novel and a publisher that went out of business. So you definitely want to stick around. My guest today is Novelist, and his book is The Last Archive. Chad R. Odom. Chad, welcome to the show. Hey, appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Thank you for joining me today. Um, just to kind of start out, the last archive is a tome. It is 740 pages, I think. Um, uh, so kind of let's just start off. Uh, what is the genre? How would you describe the genre of the book? Uh, I would say heavily science fiction. Um, but at the same time, it was originally in my mind to be fantasy. So I kept a lot of those fantasy elements. I just sort of covered it up and, and made it science believable. Then can you give us maybe just a little insight into what the book is about? Uh, of course, being 740 pages, that might be a little difficult. <laughs> but <laughs> Sure. No. The So the, the book itself is... Um, it's the design behind it is I, I love to study religion and I love to study history. So, and I, I sort of like how those two things interlace. So a lot of times, you know, if, if you're living during the time of the Romans, then the Romans are there, they're the dominant power. Therefore their religion is what you get to believe. So I took the idea of essentially Christianity and thought of it as, well, if in a thousand years from now, Christianity is the myth, then what does that myth look like? What are the main figures? What are the characters? What's the point? How did it influence people's lives? So that was sort of the backdrop to it was those things in mind. Um, And the, the, the themes that I pulled out, one was the Christianity is very much about redemption and Christianity is very much about bringing yourself from something to nothing, or from nothing to something, which is one of the big messages that made Jesus Christ so influential. Because before then, where you were born is where you were going to die. So the book starts out with this kid who is a slave. Uh, his dad was a, a big military leader, was uh, captured, put into slavery. He's raising his son. And then his son, through sports, essentially gets out of slavery, winds up in the middle of a world war. And then at the same time, there are these people called archives that are fighting a battle that no one knows about. And the main character, whose name is Orion, his father was very much involved with the archives, but he never let his son know. So now his son is being pulled into this conflict that is not worldwide, but galaxy wide and trying to tip the balance in the favor of good. While at the same time, he's also being pulled towards the bad and and sort of that dynamic. So that's somewhat long winded, I know, but taking 700 pages down to three minutes there, hopefully that works. I guess you mentioned religion, but what were some of your other influences while you were writing the book? Um, so a lot of it is personal influences. So for example, I had a, a gentleman growing up throughout my life that was in World War II 
and a lot of the stories and the things that he told and how it changed his life. But at the same time, I am a massive, massive nerd. So there are elements of Star Wars. There are elements of Ender's Game. There are elements of, um, you know, Lord of the Rings, Dungeons and Dragons that I played all the time as a kid. All of those things are sort of wrapped up in there. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot my personality is in there as well. And then this, aside from being a nerd, I'm also, I love sports. So there's a lot of sort of sports involved and, and how those things are influenced. So if you're the person who's reading the story for a story, it's great. If you're the person who's looking for the story behind the story, you're, you're going to find it. So it's kind of fun. Okay. So uh, you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, my audience is mainly uh, yeah. uh, built of tabletop RPG game masters and players. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your experience playing Dungeons and Dragons? Did you run games? Did you play mostly? So as a kid, I, I mostly played. Um, I abs- it was one of those things where I was, I was that nerdy kid that nobody really talked to, but I sort of found a niche group within that being able to go and, and play Dungeons and Dragons. But what I did all the time was craft a story in the back of my head. And originally the intent was this can be my campaign. This can be what I bring to the table next time and we can play out my Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Most of the group that I worked with and that I played with got too old, moved on. They didn't want to play anymore. So it never materialized into a Dungeons and Dragons campaign, but it did materialize into what eventually became the last archive. Do you still play? Yeah. uh, Well, not as much Dungeons and Dragons anymore, but Pathfinder is very, I'm very avid. I play that uh, probably two or three times a month. Oh. So got one of my kids into it now. So he and I are painting mini figs and coming up with stories and it's uh, <laughs> it's generational apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how do you think uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons affected you as a writer? I would have to say that it was the thing that sort of unlocked my imagination. You know, if you watch Star Trek, Star Wars, you're seeing someone else's imagination. Dungeons and Dragons especially when I was playing it as a kid, is all about your imagination. Can you picture what that person is saying in your head? Can you craft that in your mind? And then to turn around and tell the story of your character that you know, might have a couple little tidbits, he doesn't like this race or he has this affinity, but to be able to really craft that made all the difference in the world as a writer because I have to create a world. I have to create characters. They have to be relatable. They have to be familiar but um exciting and different and that's really what makes a good dungeon the dragons campaign are those elements so it was huge in how i craft stories for sure did you always write or has it come later to you always wrote but all through pretty much through high school it would be 10 pages at best and then i'd i'd give up on it um So always little bits of writing here and there. I do a lot of public speaking. I do also do a lot of seminars and educational conferences about being an author. So there's writing in that aspect as well. But as far as creative, little bits throughout my life, really solid when I, right after I got married, I was about 23, 24, when I really started to sit down and and write a ton. What really kind of kept you going and to produce uh, a book of this length? Well, uh, it actually started out as a trilogy, three parts. Um, I wrote the first part, and then it got published, and then I never published the other two. Then I finally got back after it, almost entirely rewrote the second and third books, got those out to be published, and then the publisher that I was using went out of business. And, uh, so then it was essentially starting from scratch and, um, it got to a point where, you know, writing, it was one of those things where I couldn't get the characters out of my head. I, once I got them on paper, it was like unloading something that you just have to get rid of getting it published after it was written was the same kind of thing. It was, you know what, this is a really neat story. I like to tell it and this is the best way that I can think to tell it. So I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up on it. 
I'm going to get this out there. And so actually the, the last archive is broken down into five pieces. So you can, if you look it up or try to find it, it's five individual books or one massive book. It just depends on what you prefer. But really that idea of, I like the story and I want people to hear it. I want people to experience it. I want people to love it and I want people to hate it. I just wanted to tell that story. So you mentioned that your, that your publisher went out of business. What, kind, what was that experience like? <laughs> um, it, was, it was pretty traumatic um, because it, it was like having all of your dreams just shattered at your feet um, because here my story is going to get out there and now it's just stopped altogether. Uh, then there was all the rights to it. Mm-hmm. Did I still have those? Did I maintain those? Um, so there's a lot of fear to it. And then once it took a good year for me to get all of those things hashed out. Um, and then I had to go back and still rework it. So it was essentially original work again. So there was so much to that, but at first it was just, you know, I don't drink, but if you, if you ever go to my website, I've got my little timeline of things. And I said that it was a, a, a root beer, uh, fueled time of depression <laughs> because I, I just, I almost gave up on it because I'm like, well, I can't believe I just spent all of this time putting this thing out there, really putting my heart and soul into it. And now it's gone and it's nothing that I did, but then it was pick yourself back up, do it again. But yeah, it was, it was a tough little stretch. there. Some, some authors that I interview uh, think this question might be a little sensitive. I don't since I do it with all my books, but are you self-published now? Yes. Yes. And that is mostly because of that first experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I never wanted to go through that ever again in my life. That was, you know, it, it kind of became that I can't rely on other people. So I'm going to do it myself. What do you think of the self-publishing process? In all honesty, it's, it's interesting. I've learned a lot. It's given me a really good network of editors and cover designers and narrators and all of those things. So it almost feels like you're building a business, which adds an element of excitement to what I'm doing because I'm not just writing a book, but I'm setting up a a future for myself. Um, Adds a lot more work, but it is much more me. The control is me. I can dictate what a cover looks like or what it doesn't. I can dictate how many words and not. I can dictate all of those things because to me, it's, the ultimate creative freedom. It's my work, nobody else's. No, I, I find that that's uh, true for me as well. There's, there's nobody looking over my shoulder telling me what to do. Um, it, just like when you had mentioned the company had went out of business, I can't almost fathom that they would have owned the rights to your story that you, that you worked so hard for and then you possibly couldn't have gotten it back. I, I mean, could you just like, what would that feel like? <laughs> what does that feel like? <laughs> um, so the long and the short of it is they, the, the CEO of the company is actually, he's now either in jail or just, he was in, he was embezzling money. Oh my gosh. Right. And, and so it was really odd. I, the other two books were sort of in the process of being published and I was getting these emails from employees telling me, this guy's terrible, take your stuff and run. Like <laughs> it, it was really strange. Um, but when it, I mean, the, the contract that I signed originally gave me that I kept all the rights to all of the creative process, to the names, the characters, the events, that was all mine. Mm-hmm. But the artwork, the copyright, the formatting, the, um, the text, the font, everything else was mm-hmm. owned by the publishing company. And it gets into some gray areas. Because what elements of those are theirs and what element is yours as the author and how do you separate those out? Um, And that was where the real challenge was. Him being incarcerated (laughs) wound up in my favor because essentially the, the judge who looked over things said, everything goes back to the authors for this entire company. They get everything you own none of it. None, you know, no matter who did the design or what employee you had, doesn't matter. You lose all rights. By the time that I had gotten all of that information, I had gone sort of forgiveness rather than permission. 
and had sort of started getting everything redone anyway. But that's one of the, there was about six months after it all happened where I was mortified that I was going to redo this work and get sued. So yeah, <laughs> it was just a, the worst process possible, but probably the best thing that happened to it. Since you have written such a such a large book, do you have any advice to somebody who's maybe just been mulling a story around in their head for a number of years? Uh, what 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 uh, would be a good first step for them? Sure. So I tell anybody this is probably the number one question I get asked is I've got this story. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And my advice is almost always the same. Just start writing. Doesn't matter if it makes sense. Doesn't matter. Um, if it's, if it sounds goofy, if the details aren't right, just keep writing it down. You're going to have editors, you're going to have peers who are going to tear it apart and make it better. But a lot of people will write 10 pages, they'll stop, they'll go back and they'll reread their first 10 pages and they'll never get past 10 pages because it's not perfect. Doesn't have to be. Get the story out of your head. Let other people nitpick it for you. So say somebody has been writing and they have perhaps a first draft. What then? Best thing to do. So the best thing that I have found is not to be afraid of letting other people see your work, of letting other people look at it. You're going to have a trusted circle of people. And, and within that group of people, you're going to have readers. And a lot of times your friends and your family, you're like, well, I don't want to give it to them because they're friends or family and they're always going to tell me it's good. That's not the case. They tend to be pretty harsh critics. Let them read it. Let them look at it. Let them give you their opinion because that's kind of how things are going to come out. Once they give you their opinion and they say, wow, this is great. What are you going to do with it? Now you know you've got something that's got some traction, and now it's time to maybe take the next step to look into more professional editing. If they look at you and they have that kind of, oh, it was nice, <laughs> uh, the politically correct family way of saying, you might want to reconsider and not quit your day job. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get that, then you know that maybe it's not the story, maybe it's your writing style. So what do you do to fix that? What do you do to correct that? But if you've got that draft, put it in the hands of people that you can trust and that are going to give you honest opinions, and then work with it from there. Just thinking again then about self-publishing, in your uh, experience, what would you tell somebody, maybe they have already have a finished product or something, what would you say right now as they're starting to look into self-publishing? Be prepared. Understand that you are going to go from a writer to a marketer very quickly if you want it to be any sort of success. If you just want to put it out there because you want it out there and you don't care that it sells or that it has any traction, great. But if you want it to be successful, like I do, I, I want to do nothing but write books. So you have to become a marketer. You have to look at how to get that book in the hands of the most people. You've got to worry about things like Amazon reviews. You've got to worry about things like Facebook and Amazon and Twitter and social media and how to build an audience. You've got to be able to focus on those things and be just as effective. Marketing has to be almost as much of your passion as writing does because it's going to be a huge part of your life. You've also got to keep in mind that don't be afraid to spend money. People judge books by their covers. Don't chintz. People will pick it apart if you've got grammatical errors, so make sure it's edited correctly. And then be willing to spend money to make money. You're going to pay for those ads. That's okay. Figure out how to make those ads work so that if I spend a dollar, I'm making two or even a dollar fifty or even a dollar twenty five. It's a lot of work after the writing is done. Yeah, I I always tell people that ask me, I tell them that writing the book and self-publishing it is 20% of the work, then 80% yeah. is marketing. Yeah, that is that is a pretty accurate statement. Um, <laughs> it was one of those things where I put it out there and at first I was like, well, I'm done. <laughs> and then <laughs> day after day after day, nothing ever sold. Yeah. And then I went, huh, <laughs> you know, 
I'm not as cool as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I did the same thing. And, um, uh, and I think it's easy to think, oh, well, my, my book is bad. My stuff is bad and nobody likes it. Nobody likes me. But yeah. <laughs> the, the, of course, what people have to remember is, is that just nobody knows about it. There are a lot of books out there. Just nobody knows well, about it. The other thing is that, that anybody can publish a book now, obviously. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. number one. And number two, my books will sell 10 to 15 copies a day. And 10 to 15 copies a day puts me in the top 25, the top 100 of Amazon's book sales. Yeah. So you don't have to, it's not like you have to sell 10,000 copies a day for it to get, for it to gain traction. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's the other thing to keep in mind is small successes. They seem small. A lot of times they turn out to be pretty big. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, now, of course, some people will ask, well, how do you learn how to do Facebook ads? How do you learn how to do some of that? Where do you go to learn some of that stuff? So there is a ton of, I mean, Google is a wonderful tool. Mm-hmm. It works for this. Facebook gives its own clinics on how to do certain things. Um, if, if you're getting into it, you know, a gentleman named Mark Dawson, he, mm-hmm. you have to pay for his courses, but he's got everything from Amazon to Facebook to pretty much any other self-published marketing media that you can possibly look into. And he tells you how to do everything from pulling keywords, building target audiences. But when I started this, to be honest, I thought about, well, what was it that, what elements, what likes do I have that made me write this book? The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, Ender's Game. And I crafted those things because if I'm interested in it enough to write it, it's probably where I'll find my readers. And so I started out doing ads all on my own and then realized I was effective to a certain point. That's when I started finding those other resources to really make my ads worthwhile. And and these days, if I spend $30 a day, I make 60 to 65 back. When I first started, I was spending $20 a day and making maybe $20.50. So it really is a trial and error. It also is keeping your thumb on what's popular and what, again, if you're an interest of something, for example, I just watched the show Carnival Row on Mm -hmm. Amazon and I liked it. So guess what? I'm probably going to find people who want to read my books because they're interested in similar things. So keeping your ears out for that and being practical helps a ton. Are you writing a new book or a new series? So, I, I, I won't, uh, I think <laughs> because I'm an author and I think I'm clever, um, <laughs> I've got sort of a really unique idea that it's almost like creating your own universe, which is fun. So the next series that I'm writing, it's a three book series. First book is about two thirds done and it is, it is strictly fantasy. There's no science fiction about it. It is um, wizards and dragons and, and all of those things. Um, definitely, I mean, every author says this, but it's going to be different. It's going to have things that you don't expect. It's going to have things that you don't look for, but I've also got a way to where everything that I write will connect. Um, so it's going to be totally different than what I've got out there in the last archive, but it is going to, in one way, shape or form relate back. And I've got all that plotted out. But a series will be called The Dark Covenant. And uh, I would imagine that I will have, I typically don't publish until I've got at least two thirds of the entire series ready to go. Um, So I would imagine that this will be out starting probably spring of next year. I'll have the first book will be out and ready to go. And then the second and third will not be too far behind. I don't know if you stay up with other authors and that on Amazon, um, but it seems like some authors are releasing a novel a month or something like that. Um, no. what, what are some of your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, how long does it usually take you to write a novel? So what I found, what I found is this, is that I mentioned earlier that you become as much of a marketer as you do a writer. And I think that they get, they get an audience built. So if you're 
Bob the author, now Bob the author has a following. And so I realized that I can continue to produce a book every single month and people are going to pick that up because I have a following. But you typically don't put your best work into it because you're just trying to mass produce. So a lot of authors, and I'm not trying to say that they're bad, but a lot of authors will actually, the, the quality of their books will decline because of the fact that they're, they're writing to market rather than writing to write. Um, and so for me, I would rather have a slower build, but have my passion and my emotion into things. So for me, the last archive with everything that it went through was almost a 10 year ordeal. Dark Covenant is going to be more like a year. So for me to put out three books in a year, that's kind of where I'd like to be is three to four books max per year. But I want them to be quality stuff. I don't want to just throw it out there because I know I have an audience that I can make money off of, you know, but I'm also that person that realizes I may never be able to retire and write books. And the people who write books every month probably can't. So <laughs> there's, there's the trade off to that. Okay. okay. Well, you just mentioned that it took you about 10 years to write the last ar archive. Um, well, what was the process like learning how to write a novel? Um, I mean, it was, it was literally doing it just, you know, sitting down at a computer with word and typing. Um, Started to write, started to do it. I had just had a set of twins, so they were <laughs> itty bitty. So it was being done really late at night. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would just start writing, writing, writing. And then I had to, I got hung up a lot in the beginning on names because I realized, okay, I need another character or I need this or I need that. And so I would stop and have to think of a character's name. Then I got good at just plugging in, in bold, you know, character one character two, and then eventually coming up with a name so that I was productive when I wrote and not stuck on names. Um, I didn't really get into formatting any of it or doing any of the hard part until a few years after it was all done. And then I realized the importance of spacing and uh, chapter headings and all those kind of things. But it really did start out as simple as, here's my Word document, Times New Roman, size 12, double space, go. <laughs> and, uh, and, and letting it flow until it was all out of my head. And, then, and again, then I went back afterwards to, to try and perfect it and change things and, and do that. But that's what it was. I don't know if I'm wording this right, but if you were to talk to somebody who wanted to write a novel, what are, what are some advice for actually putting the words on the page? Like a lot of people get hung up with their sentences and their words and things like that. It's just like, what is some advice for somebody to kind of just get over that and to kind of uh, just get on with writing their novel? Yeah, it's, it's, I make the analogy. It's like uh, taking your t-shirt off at the beach. Um, you're always going to have a freckle. You're always going to have the mole. You're always going to be a little, heavier or a little skinnier than you want. But at the end of the day, if you really want the enjoyment to take your shirt off, put some sunscreen on and go play. So when it comes to a novel, you are going to be your own worst critic. So you might write something and go, man, that really isn't how I want it to come out, but it's the basics of it is there. Move on, move on, write two or three chapters down. And usually as it happens, you go, you know what, this would be a great way to say that. And then if you want, you can go back and, and make that change. What I tend to do is I keep a little notebook with me. And as I get ideas or inspiration that isn't what I'm writing right now, I write it in that notebook so I don't forget it. But I also don't try to keep it in my brain and distracting me from keeping the story going. Start the story, get through it, warts and all, finish the story, then go back and, and perfect those things that you wanted to do better. Besides that, your writing style gets better the more that you write. So if you're just starting out a book, it's going to be really rusty and clunky at first. Then you get a flow to it. Then you can take that flow back to the beginning and really make it work well. I guess another question that I, I like to ask authors, do you outline or do you write by the seat of your pants, as they say? Um. I outline, but I, to give you an easy example, the last archive, 700 pages, it was a three-page out, three outline. Okay. And it, it was just 
all of the major plot points that I knew had to happen and a few of the rules of the world that I was working with. And the rest was, it sort of, again, I, I go back to Dungeons and Dragons. As you're playing a campaign on a tabletop kind of scenario, your character takes turns you didn't expect. The, the, the DM is going to throw things at you that you didn't expect. Writing is no different. If, if one of your characters doesn't break your heart, you haven't done a good enough job because they should take you into places that are unexpected. Let them do that because that's usually when your best writing happens. Now, I had asked you earlier if uh, Dungeons and Dragons had affected you being a novelist, and you said yes. Well, does being a novelist affect the way you play? Most definitely, because <laughs> um, I I become overly critical of my friends who are doing the DM part <laughs> um, because I'm like, no, 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 more depth. You know, tell me about how the slobber on the giant wolf smells. Um, so it's it's funny, and my friends sort of expect me to heckle them a little bit when we play, but it also allows me to think about the character and put myself into, you know, my little one inch tall minifig and say, well, no, he wouldn't do that. Or he would do that. Or this is how he would act. And this is how it, he would behave. And I mean, one of the characters that I'm writing in my new fantasy story is quite literally crafted from my Pathfinder character that I've developed over, you know, a month and a half, two month campaign because I put vested interest into the character. But it also helps because if you've ever done a DM, if the players that are there aren't vested in the story, it is really boring. Mm -hmm. So it helps me better as a player. And I've done very little D of the DM part of things, but it helps me to be able to give them better vision of what's happening. And it pulls them into what we're doing a little bit more. I'm sure there's a number of people in my audience who, who would like to write, who would like to write a novel uh, or even a RPG campaign or adventure. Um, just uh, kind of from your own experience, from obviously having a family and having a day job, uh, when do you make time to write? How, what are some strategies for that? There, there's a few different things that I've learned. One is that I write best when nobody else is around. So when my kids were younger and they still demanded all of dad's time when he was home from work, it was, it, it, my writing time came at the cost of either time with my spouse or time asleep. But it was one of those things where I would set a goal and I would say, okay, I am going to write X amount of pages this week. So if it was 20 pages, that meant, you know, three pages a day. So I would write three pages and sometimes that would take me three hours. Sometimes that would take me 20 minutes. It just depended on how much I was into it. But that's what it is. If you want time, you have to make time. So now my kids are older. My wife is starting to see the fact that my book you know, is profitable. It makes money. So it's stopped. For her, it stops being a hobby. And it's more of, okay, you know, he could really do this. So she's also like, hey, go write. Go have fun. Go do it. Absolutely. And then I, these days I have another friend of mine that I've written a few things with and I will have him over once a week just to get my brain functioning and to keep my head in the creative space and not necessarily in the, you know, T's and Q's of writing. So those are just little things that I've learned. He'll have a, a problem with his story that he's writing and I'll start to throw my creative weight behind it. And all of a sudden it'll open up my mind to really help me where I'm stuck. And then I'm much more motivated to go and to take my, my hour or two hours and write things out. But set the goal and then plot out when it's going to happen. Everybody's life is different. There are times that I've had to get up at five instead of seven. Just stick to the goal and make it happen. Uh, where can people uh, find, more, find out more about you and your work? So my website, it's uh, chadrodom.com. So it's all there. I've got, if you go to Amazon, you can find The Last Archive or you can find me. There's an author page out there on Amazon. There's, um, I have a Goodreads uh, author profile. And then social media, Twitter, it's uh, Twitter is Chad R. Odom 03. Facebook is, um, I think it's just Chad R. Odom. 
facebook.com backslash Chad R. Odom. That's my group. So you can find it there. Uh, I do a little dabbling in Instagram. I'm not very good at it yet. <laughs> so bear with me on that one. But my, I try to increase my social media presence. Those are the best ways to find me. Okay. And I will go ahead and link some of those up in the uh, show notes for this episode so that people can find you. All right, Chad. Well, thank you for coming on the show today. Um, it was a great pleasure to have you on. And yeah, you. Um, I wish you the best with uh, your work. Thank you very much. I had a great time. Thank you. Well, there you have it, guys. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with Chad today. As I mentioned, I have linked up his website and his books in the show notes for this episode, which you can find at DiceGeeks.com. If you want free stuff, please go to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You will get 10 free dungeon maps and some other RPG resources that you can use in your campaigns, and you will also never miss an episode of this show. If you enjoy this podcast, if you want me to keep making episodes of this podcast, I would be very grateful if you would head over to Patreon slash Dice Geeks. Any support for this show just lets me know that you want me to continue making these episodes. So until next time, keep gaming.